when I was invited to give this talk, it seemed pretty obvious what I talked about. For the past four, maybe five years, it's been my personal belief that every single person in this room, in this state, in this country, everybody should learn to code. And I put a lot of my own time into, into making that a reality. Um, and so, when I was invited to give this talk, I did what I always do, which is start collecting statistics and making slides. So, you know, I went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, and I looked up, like, the median pay for software engineers in the Bay Area. Uh, I also do this thing where I look up quotations from famous people. So, for example, here's Bill Clinton. He's saying there are going to be a lot of jobs for programmers. And, you know, here's, here's Marco Rubio saying those jobs are going to pay you a lot of money. And, you know, it's not just politicians. Here's an ordinary citizen saying, Programming is the American dream. And so I was doing this and it was coming along pretty nicely. I had my slides done and then I thought, okay, you guys live in Palo Alto. This is, this is the Bay Area. And in a way, you guys already know all of this stuff. And so if I start talking to you about how programming is the next big thing, it's going to be a boring talk. And so I thought about it and I thought, I don't want to talk about this, right? This, this, is, this is boring. And so, if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk about something completely different today. This is a trebuchet. Trebuchets are things people used to use to throw stuff at other people, and trebuchets are really close to my heart. I spent the vast majority of fifth grade building trebuchets out of cardboard and duct tape and rubber bands and, and small pieces of metal, and Trebuchets were my life. And this all came back to me uh, around a couple of months ago in physics class when I came across this program, uh, this, um, this problem in my homework. And this is what my physics textbook thinks a trebuchet is. This, it's a seesaw with a bowling ball on one end. And this, this made me mad. Right? Like, okay, first of all, it was a hard problem, so I was already in a frustrated mood. But then, uh, and then I thought, Really, is, is this what a trebuchet is? I mean, what am I doing? Why am I taking this class? Um, and eventually, you know, I had dinner, I came back, I figured it out, um, it's angular momentum. But the question actually stayed with me, why am, I taking a, why am I taking a physics class? And I encourage you to think about this. I mean, look around, look at each other. Imagine if every single person in this room today grew up to become a physicist. I don't know about you, but I think that world is boring. And so, you know, I, I personally believe that we need a world where there, sure, there are physicists, but there are also doctors, there are lawyers, there are, there are artists, there are writers and journalists. I think we need a world where not everyone grows up to become a physicist. And so why are we teaching everyone phys physics? So I thought about this. I thought about it for a really long time. And, and here's what I came up with. Let's think about fire, right? Fire is one of those things that is just so powerful and dangerous and consuming. And in a way, that's what makes it attractive to us. You know, we as humans, we're attracted by the enigma of fire. And physics, physics is a thing that lets us control fire. It lets us put fire to work for us. And that's a really powerful thing. Because once we can control fire, we can do all sorts of stuff. We can make steel, we can fight forest fires, we can, we can light up the sky on New Year's Eve, but without physics, we can't do any of that. And so, so when your high school teaches you physics, it's not putting you through another boring few semesters of a science class, it is giving you agency in the world you live in. And, and so I was thinking about this and I realized that's what I want to talk about today. Today I want to talk to you about agency in the world you live in. The ancient Romans had a saying, and in Latin it goes omnitrium perfectum, and in English it goes everything's better when it comes in groups of three. Um, this holds true for Goldilocks and the three bears, it holds true for Neapolitan ice cream, and it holds true for agency. And I think agency is made up of three components. First one is convenience. On a regular day, when you're using your computer, think about how many times you feel like you're fighting your computer. Think about how many times Microsoft Word is just not doing what you want it to do. When something freezes or your work gets destroyed, doesn't it feel like your computer is controlling you some days? 
And isn't that really awful? Because we're the ones meant to be controlling the computers. That, that's what computers were built to do. And I believe that the way you get back control of your computer is by learning to program. My teachers, a lot of them upload, upload grades on websites. And look, personally, I am all for technology in the classroom. I think that is a great thing. But at the same time, something amazing happens when you start uploading grades on websites. I forget to check them, right? Like I go a full semester and just completely oblivious to the state of my grades. And you know, two days before the final, I realize I should probably check my grades. And you know, you, you, you know how that ends. So I thought about this, right? I, I asked my friends, like, what do you guys do? Do you, do you check it like every night? Because that, that doesn't sound like a good thing to do. Um, and I asked around, and some people said, well, I write it on my calendar, you know, once a month. And some people said, I have an alarm on my iPhone. And I was like, I don't know. Those, those don't sound like the right solutions. Computers are meant to be working for us. We control the computers. And so I wrote a computer program. And all it does is every night at midnight, it goes to the website, and it checks if the grades are uploaded, and it sends out an email if they are. And I thought this was pretty clever, so I sent it out to a few of my friends. And by the end of my second year, like half my class was using this. And I thought this was great. I mean, I, I did something that made the lives of a few people incrementally easier. And I couldn't have done it without knowing how to program. And it's not just making people's lives easier. The other day, I was on a bus with a friend. Um, and we were in the middle of nowhere, so there was no internet. And we were talking about the state of Mississippi. And suddenly, suddenly my friend, he he turned to me, he stopped talking, and then he opened his mouth and he said, you know what's funny about the word Mississippi? It has two S's in a row and two P's in a row, and isn't that funny? And I was like, I guess that's funny. And, and then he said, well, are there any words that have three of the same letter in a row? I was like, I don't know. And he was like, I don't know either. And so we sat there, we didn't know. And, and then I realized, no, come on, we're programmers. This is easy. We should be able to figure this out. And so I took out my computer and I wrote this like one line program that went through the dictionary and found all words that have three of the same letter in a row. And you know, this, this isn't particularly surprising. This isn't a hard program to write. But, but this program makes me realize that I still have control over my computer. A computer feels like a magic wand to me. It feels like an extension of my mind. And I want that to be true for every single person here. OK, that's it for part one. Part two is about safety and security. What do I mean by that? Well, I went on Google Images and got a picture of a hacker for you. This is a person who hacks while standing up with one hand in binary in the dark. I think this is amazing and laudable. But at the same time, I don't think this is the kind of hacker that we should be worrying about. I think we should put our sights on bigger questions. I think we should be asking questions like, can your insurance company look at your search history? And if they see that you've been Googling symptoms of asthma, can they use that against you? Can they deny you coverage? Or, or can a federal judge compel you to disclose your password? And if so, what if you forget your password? Or, or is the FCC responsible for regulating internet companies, internet service providers? Does that mess with the free market? Or is it important to regulate them? This t-shirt, until very recently, was illegal to export for the from the United States. And, and here's why. This t-shirt on it has a small computer program that can do encryption. And until recently, the US government classified encryption as a weapon. And so by exporting this t-shirt, you would be exporting encryption, which is a weapon. And look, I mean, I don't know what they would do if you wore this at an airport. Like, would they stop you? I don't know. And you might think this is completely silly. Or you might think there are good, there are good points to be made here. But what's important is, this is still a debate that's happening. If you think about it, isn't this the same thing as the privacy versus law enforcement debate that we've been having all of last year and probably this year too? You know what? Think about who's going to be having that debate really soon. 
maybe tomorrow. It's you guys. You are the people who are going to grow up to become the future lawmakers and the, and the politicians and the policy makers. You're the citizens who are going to vote on these measures. And so I think it's really important for you guys to know the facts, to be able to have an informed and meaningful debate about these things. And I think a computer science education gives that to you. And at the same time, I don't want to scare you, because yeah, there are safety, there are security things, but computers, above all, are a medium for expression. This is an artist, his name is Austin Cleon, and he specializes in an art form called blackout art. What is blackout art? Well, what he does is he takes a newspaper and he grabs a Sharpie and he just blacks out words until he reveals what he thinks the true message of that thing, of that article is. And I, I thought this was brilliant, right? So, so that night I got home and I built a website and I called it Blackout. And what it does is it takes a, a quotation from 1984 because that's relevant. And I, I, I made it so that if you click on a word, it blacks out. And thought, well, this is kind of fun. What happens if I give this to my friends? And so I gave this to one of my best friends. And, and like two minutes later, he sent this back to me. It, it says, I don't know if you can read that. It says, the alien awakening happened. And I thought that was great. Well, I mean, you can find these words. What else can you find? So I, I put it on social media. And the next thing I got back was even better. It says, the future might be a party. <laughs> Look, if you know the tools that are involved, this isn't a hard program to write. But at the same time, this is one of the programs I'm most proud of writing in my entire life. Because what this program did was, it started a discussion among people. It created a little bit of empathy. And, and isn't that really what computers are for? Let's talk about spam filters. Does anybody know how a spam filter works? A spam filter, what it does is, it looks at words and pairs of words, and it creates a statistical model of what spam sounds like. Right, so, so a spammy message might have the words get rich quick in greater frequency than an ordinary message. And thought, great, so, so now we have these huge databases in Gmail that know what spam looks like. Well, what happens if we turn this upside down? Can, can we get a spam filter to produce spam? Right? Turns out you can. And, and you get these fantastic results. This one says, I am only 18 and rolling in cash. Right? And it's cool enough that a machine can do this, but then I thought, why stop at spam? How about, what's the opposite of spam? The opposite of spam is email I send out, right? So what happens if you take email I send out? Turns out, you get pretty good results. And then, and then I asked, why stop at email? And so, so I, um, I crawled the New York Times website, and I collected headlines from the past couple of years, and I got this. And then I thought, OK, well, why stop at just one source? What can you do with multiple sources? So I grabbed uh, an online copy of an undergraduate ad algebra textbook, and I grabbed the complete works of Shakespeare, and I got this result. Look, that, that wasn't it. After that, I wondered, well, what if, what if you just give up on words entirely? What if you do it with music? What if you do it with paintings? And I, I think what if questions are really the key here. I think the most important things computers do is they allow us to ask what if questions. They allow us to take a silly question and explore it and push it and see what can we get out of it. And sure, sometimes they're stupid questions. Or sometimes they're questions where we don't know the answers. We have no way of figuring them out. And we're going to hit those questions. And then what do we do? Well, we turn around and we ask a new one. Because if we don't, who, who will? Right? It's our responsibility to ask what-if questions. There was a famous computer scientist that everybody in college learns about, and his name was Edgar Dijkstra. And Dijkstra said the most profound thing I've ever heard about computers. He said, computers are to computer science as telescopes are to astronomy. And what, well, what did he mean by that? It's really easy to go around and say, well, computer science is, you know, it's, it's a great way to get a high paying job, or you can create the next big app, or you can start the next billion dollar startup. And I agree, sure, you can do those things, but 
look, in this room right now, it's not filled with future computer scientists. It's filled with future lawyers. It's filled with future doctors. It's filled with future engineers and scientists. It's filled with future artists and writers and painters. It's filled with, above all, it's filled with enough curiosity to light up a village. And I think computers, computers, all their purpose is, is a way to take that curiosity and point it at the important things, the big ideas that matter. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from the past 15 minutes, it's this. It's not about, it's not about the computers. It's about the big ideas. It's not about the telescopes. It's about the stars.